this computer. Yeah, my game hey, Johnny. All right, brother. Okay, cool. So I'm here with Johnny Longinidis, which is a Greek name. You're, you're originally from Greece? I am first generation American. So my parents were both, uh, you know, born in Greece. I was born here in the States in America. I live in Connecticut, which is right. the East Coast. Yeah. About two hours east of New York City. So, but obviously I go back to Greece very often as I have, uh, you know, many family members that are still living there. So I do consider myself American Greek. Yeah, you speak Greek then also, right? Love it, man. Love it. <laughs> That's like Dutch, you know, like uh, we know words in 10 languages, but don't know how to pronounce either of them like in a right way. There's always this thick Dutch accent, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I get it. I get it. Anyway, um, um, I reach out to you because um, you are an instructor in the Oxygen Advantage, right? I am, yes. That's and, and the Oxygen Advantage is about Buteco, as I understand, sure. right? Yeah. So, um, and you know, like, and you know, I'm a Wim Hof method instructor, which seems like the opposite of Buteco, but still my, the two words, what I say during courses is always, you know, breathe slowly. If you breathe less, you have a longer life, but you're happier, you're calmer. So like, I'm like the non Buteco guy promoting Buteco. And I've saw some videos and some ways of unblocking your nose that I have from Buteco and the, the power of slow breathing. But, you know, honestly, I don't know a lot about it. And there were like a few times already people who've asked me, can you do something about Buteco? And then I met you and I thought like, wow, man, yeah, can we do, can we please do this Zoom? So maybe you, well, you know, like if you want, just, just go ahead. Yeah, that's great. Um, <clears throat> you know, it's interesting that you say, right, Hoff is maybe the opposite of Buteco and Buteco, the, you know, the, the opposite ends of the spectrum. And in some ways, I guess that's true. Um, but then in other ways, you know, what I found throughout my journey is that really, you know, like we spoke on earlier, that sometimes it takes, uh, you know, different methods to get people to, you know, to the one destination. Mm -hmm. And and I really don't want, I don't like the idea of getting caught under one dogma of belief, like this is how you're supposed to breathe. Um, you know, everybody is built differently. Now, with that said, what I do like and then what, draw, what drew me to the Oxygen Advantage of Buteco was the fact that they, they based the, well, especially with what Patrick's done with, uh, with Buteco's work. And he's really based... Um, a lot of his work is based on science, you know, mm -hmm. and understanding that um, breathing light and breathing less and generating a, a higher tolerance to CO2 mm. is optimal for oxygen uptake. Mm. So no matter how you look at it, whatever breathing technique you're going to get into, the science behind it is, is the science. Um, you need to have CO2 present for oxygen to get delivered into your cells and tissues. You're talking about the Bohr effect, right? Exactly. Yeah. Um, exactly. 100%. Can, can, you, can you explain that maybe shortly for the people who don't know what the Bohr effect is? Yeah, without getting into too much, you know, technical science and mm -hmm. chemistry and whatnot, Essentially, what occurs is, so CO2, so you have oxygen, right? Generally, the, the thought is, right, we breathe in oxygen and we expel out CO2, and, which, is, which is generally true, but we do breathe out oxygen as well, okay. Of course. But it's generally thought of CO2 as being a waste gas. It's commonly said in, uh, you, you see it uh, in, um, in uh, you know, in text, you see it in even science journals. You, you hear it all the time. CO2 is just a waste gas. And even beyond that, I mean, even now with uh, everything going on with, uh, with uh, climate change, CO2 is just demonized, right? Like the CO2 yeah. gas is building up. So like everything about CO2 just has this negative connotation, right? This stigma. Where in actuality, CO2 is, 
extremely important, actually can be very, is very beneficial to the human body um, when adapted to properly. So what occurs is essentially CO2, when CO2 is present in the body, a chemical reaction occurs between CO2 and water, okay? okay. So the, the, the most efficient way for oxygen to get delivered to our cells and tissues is when hemoglobin attaches to oxygen, mm -hmm. okay? This is called, it's called affinity. And when hemoglobin attaches, as opposed to saturation, 70 times more oxygen gets delivered to your cells and tissue when hemoglobin attaches to oxygen and can release that oxygen to your cells and tissue as opposed to saturation, okay? Yeah. But for hemoglobin to release that oxygen, mm -hmm. that chemical reaction between CO2 and water needs mm -hmm. to occur, creating bicarbonate, which changes the pH in your blood just enough, which basically signals to your body like, mm -hmm. oh shoot, we need more oxygen. Hemoglobin release that oxygen. Uh, and it will go to your cells and tissues. If CO2 is not present, that oxygen gets wasted just like CO, just like, um, just like CO2 and it gets expelled out. It doesn't get used. You breathe it out. You breathe it out. Interesting. So <clears throat> when you talk about over breathing or mouth breathing, and, and, and I'm talking about this as being a chronic issue is when you really want to what you really want to look at. So, you know, when we talk about exercises like, like such as, you know, the Hoff techniques and, um, you know, and other tumos and things of that nature, um, you know, those are short periods of time where we're, we're, we're looking to get, our goal is, is something quite different. Um, we're yeah. looking to create a different uh, experience and environment within the body. So yeah. um, what we're looking more at, with uh, OA, Oxygen Advantage Buteco, is, you know, how are you breathing the other 23 hours and, and 38 minutes of your day? What the science shows is optimally is breathing nasally, for the most part, breathing nasally, so you're not expelling excess CO2 that you don't need to be. And a lot of us are just unconsciously, we don't realize that we're doing it. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's inefficient. So it's bringing awareness back to like, wait a minute, I'm just sitting right now. Um, there's really no reason for me to be either breathing shallowly. Yeah. yeah but breathing really, right. There's no, there's, no, there's not really uh, you know, much benefit to that. So. Mm -hmm. So um, let's say, you know, like, because for me, I make a distinction between over breathing because for me, over breathing, I only do, do that during breathing techniques. For me, over breathing is first to the belly, then to the chest. Yep. But then you are using the word over breathing as um, breathing too much. Right. Yeah. So, so it, it can be, it can be looked at two ways. So breathing too much, being too much volume. Right. Yeah. And essentially volume and then rate. Right. So like I could breathe really deeply, but breathe slowly. And essentially the amount of liters of oxygen that I breathe in might not be that. So if I'm breathing in I'm probably breathing at a rate right there. That's about four breaths per minute. And that's about, you know, on a, that may be like a 12 second breath or whatever it might be. Yeah. So even though that volume might be a little bit more per breath, my, my rate is slow as well. So there's two different factors. Okay. Yeah. So, so, um, because, you know, like if we say, if we CrossFit, you know, you do, do intense sports. You need to over breathe to get, you know, like get rid of the CO2 and, and get the oxygen in. And during breathing techniques, like Wim Hof method, for example, but there's many more, you also do that, but it's temporarily. So there's, this is like the big difference between what is healthy and what is unhealthy. If you're unaware and you're always breathing, like, especially in the chest, 20 times a minute, 
then um, this is non-beneficial. I don't like to use the word dangerous because it makes people freak out. It's non-beneficial. Yeah. Well, during sports, you know, you need to get the air in because you need, you need like the oxygen, right? And during a breathing technique, it would be unhealthy to do six hours of Wim Hof breathing every day. I would say, <laughs> I mean, I, would I wouldn't know. I would as well, yeah. I wouldn't know where you get the time uh, from to, to, to do that. But then it's more about this, this, how are you breathing when you're basically not thinking about breathing in your daily life? And what I've noticed, and this is always a test that I do, you know, in my courses, because my, my two words are breathe slowly. Um, before the course, we set a few benchmarks. And one of them is how many times do you breathe per minute, breathing frequency? And let's say it's like nine times. And then after half an hour of breathing techniques, where I personally find the Wim Hof method or other breathing techniques with deeper breathing and breath hold, because you like, you go to your sympathetic fight or flight, produce adrenaline, but then also to the other side. This, so it's like an interval training. Um, but I'm, I'm, you know, like I'm a nerd also, and it's my job, you know, so I'm very aware of that. But um, after half an hour of breathing, on average, people breathe two and a half to three times less. So nine becomes three, four. Mm -hmm. And that is, you know, like my point, apart from certain health benefits and what's happening, you know, that's not the subject of this video, is that my biggest lesson is that I've learned to really, really slow down my breathing. So I notice that if I'm unaware of my breathing and I'm walking, for example, and I'm like, hey, you know, I get this moment, like, how am I breathing? I'm breathing to the belly, nose in, nose out, and often also four in or one, two breathing, like say four counts in and eight counts out, something like that, you know? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So in, in that sense, over breathing is not a unhealthy thing, but if you're unaware and always over breathing, what I understand, and correct me if I'm wrong, if you're doing that, you're getting, you're, um, you're, you're breathing out too much CO2. Also, and it's not so much about breathing in too much oxygen. That's not really the problem. You're breathing out too, too much CO2. So breathe it out from the lungs. And then also in your muscle and your nerve tissue, there's not enough CO2. And when that is below that certain threshold, then what you just described, that chemical reaction doesn't take place. Uh, bicarbonate, right, uh, yeah. is not made. And this is why oxygen is not released to the muscle tissue. So if you're continuously over breathing or hyperventilating or just taking too many breaths per, per, per minute, you don't get oxygen in your muscles, right? Yeah, yes. So let me, um, and I, I, I like a lot of what you said right there. Um, and let me kind of piggyback off that. And I, maybe I can, if you don't mind, I can shed a little bit of light Thanks. onto um, maybe a potentially another reason why the breathing rate gets slower after over breathing like that. So I do believe that everything you're saying, that it's bringing awareness to the breath, you're, you're teaching them to breathe slower, and, you know, through that awareness and maybe some expansion, right, in the lungs that they're able to get their rates slower. But understanding also as well, and you, you might, I'm sure you probably understand some of this as well, but maybe some of your students, maybe, maybe they don't, not, not everybody does, mm -hmm. is understanding that the, the trigger, right, or the, what causes us to take another breath CO2. Has very, yeah, exactly. It has very little to do with the lack of oxygen. Mm -hmm. it's, it's borderline, unless we're practicing hypoxic training, we're at 15,000 feet, we're at high elevation. Our blood oxygen saturation generally hovers around 96 to 98%. Yes. So it's not a lack of oxygen. No. It's the presence of CO2, right? That feeling that you have in your stomach that's like, I'm shit, I need to take another breath. Yeah. is your your relationship to co2 it's how it's how much your, your tolerance level where that's at i need to expel that co2 hmm. i'm also working closely with another group called uh this would be really good for your 
students to action. I'm working on doing a seminar with them. Well, I'm a student with them this for the next three weeks. It's uh, later on today. They're called um, Shift and Adapt or The Art of Breath. Brian McKenzie is him and his group are, I, I think, at the forefront as well. Mm -hmm. uh, when it comes to breaking the breath down and understanding the breath, its relationship to pain, its relationship to stress. And they, when they talk about CO2, they talk about C CO2 is the stress molecule. Yeah, I, <clears throat> well, yeah, it, it's, you know, like one thing that I've really come to understand that nothing is always true. So, you know, putting it like that would be like um, demonizing, I don't know if that's the right English word, the CO2, you know, like stigmatizing CO2. Yeah, I think what do you that. think about that? Is it the stress molecule? I think when you do look at it, um, it is sense. So if if you were to, it was actually explained really well, and I don't know if you read James Nestor's book, Breath, that just came out. Um, I highly recommend that. He he did he did a great job of breaking down. He okay. went from you know from ancient pranayama techniques all the way through all these different uh, you know modalities. Anyways, and um, oh, I just lost my train of thought there. So yeah, I, I, I have so CO two. So he they did a test where essentially <clears throat> to test and see like how an abundance of CO2 really, it, it, it does, it builds a high level of stress in your body. Mm -hmm. So they did a test where they took essentially like tubes, canisters of CO2, and they like injected them like, you know, into, into a person to see how stressed they get. And it's, it's essentially a feeling of like suffocation, stress, like it builds up to a point where it's like, get me the hell out of here. They're freaking out like high levels of CO2. They get blasted in you <laughs> and they likened it to like suffocation to like, you know, they would do anything they could to stop this from happening. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, if I, like, if, if you were to just uh, have your students or yourself not over breathe and breathe, breathe out that CO2 and do a strong breath hold, after however amount of time, a minute, minute and a half, that stress that they're feeling of needing to take a breath has nothing to do, or very, very little to do with the lack of oxygen. It's just the buildup of CO2, which is like the stress molecule. Yeah. So I, I hear, yeah, I do hear what you're saying. You don't want to demonize it, but it does give us a little bit of a good understanding of what it does. Mm. And then once we can train, train ourselves or train other people to create a higher tolerance to that, right? Knowing that we'll be safe. Like mm -hmm. that stress is literally something that we can adapt to. Totally. Because mm -hmm. if you look at top sporters and you know, like, I think this is exactly the same story. You know, top sporters, of course, build up muscle. But what happens when you build up muscle, you go sympathetic, basically, you know, like adrenaline running. <clears throat> and then you really build your muscles in the resting period afterwards, right? This is basic sports philosophy basically mm -hmm. but another thing is happening and this is why and this is maybe also where the mental part comes into play is that say we have the same amount of muscles but you have more of a mental strength and a higher resilience against a resistance against a buildup of co2 if we take a sprint you can run twice as fast and you know and it's this that's not because of our bodies they are exactly the same but just because you are okay with a higher level of co2 and you freak out later than i do and this is why i have to give up and you keep on like top 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 where are you tim you know like that so that's why top sporters have a very high tolerance of co2 so that's it's a very healthy thing to train basically you know a hundred percent. Yeah. I couldn't have explained that better. Yeah. You, the, the, the biggest difference is, and you know, now with, you know, athletically, once you get to a certain level, like most people there, there's not much of a difference, right? When you get to high level sport, no. athletically, we're, we're all, it's all really, really close. So the, you know, where, where people where athletes are trying to now where they're finding the, they can get the edge 
is obviously is up here is like right understanding mental game with you know meditation techniques and whatever it is and now they're finally seeing that the breath can be used and learning how to manipulate it or really to harness the power of it is is, is turning into you know a, just like a massive massive tool that just like that that can really start to separate like you said when you're getting stressed out and you're starting to gas out and and now I've been training with, you know, this breath work training, whatever it might be. And I, oh, I know what this feels like. And I can still breathe in and out of my nose mm -hmm. or learn how to, how to shift gears, right? Go from, and then go to, and then keep down regulating, getting to, yeah. right? And learning how to keep shifting. Yeah. So not staying inefficient, inefficient, right? Like red zone and then downshifting. Like yeah. it's, it's, it's done. training to do that. Yeah. Yeah. It's funny. It's funny. You're like uh, from the Boteco school. I'm from the Wim Hof method school, but we're both just nerds finding out what's, what is really out there. Oh yeah, man. We, yeah. 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 <clears throat> I love, I'm, I love everything that I want to learn even more about the, the Hoff technique. Because to be quite honest with you, what started me off on this journey was, was Hoff. Oh, really? Yeah. yeah. It was Hoff. It was, it was right. his technique. And, uh, you know, I'm watching this, this eccentric character that's doing this. You know, anytime you, I see anybody, like, they have the capabilities to do these amazing things. It's like, well, they're showing us that any human being can do this exactly that so is, you know yeah. Wim, Wim is, is he used to say the Iceman the Iceman fuck the Iceman you can do this yourself you know like <clears throat> and I will uh, if I if, if, when I see him I will uh, I will tell you this uh, I will tell him this you know like just like this guy Johnny from Connecticut saying hi I would love um, that, man. I'd, I'd love so to. Uh, just a, a question that is that I'm wondering: if I would be a top sporter, you know, like top top three of the world, and I want to be the number one, should I be? Could I be doing this this test that you just said, where people were what in their blood veins, or or they were breathing in CO2 only, where they were like getting an overload of CO2 and like getting stressed out? Wouldn't that be an amazing training for a top sporter to really mentally get to, you know, being mentally even stronger and be the number one instead of the top three? Could this be in training? Oh, well, I, I don't know if I would go right to like just shooting CO2 into their mouth, right? Like that might be too stressful, but a hundred percent, in my opinion, I, you know, I don't want to say a hundred, nothing's a hundred percent, but in my opinion, and, and based on, um, based on the science and based on what I'm seeing from, you know, from my athletes and what I'm seeing from other athletes, mm -hmm. that there's no doubt that l training properly, like creating a progressive, uh, you know, training protocol for, for athletes to slowly begin to develop a tolerance to CO2 and to the stress that, that, uh, you know, that, that garners within, um, mm -hmm. within them it will become a, an, a, an incredible tool in their athletic endeavors. There's, there's no way around it. It's not just like, it's, it's hard, hard science. Yeah. And I think many top sporters already practice it. Maybe, maybe with knowing it, but maybe without knowing it. Maybe without, absolutely. You're right. Yeah. <laughs> but I think, you know, like it's just the breath is the big secret, you know, like, when, what is yoga? Exercise with breathing. What is meditation? Slow down your breathing. Why does somebody, you know, like uh, uh, can perform better than others because they build up CO2 tolerance? You know, it, it, it's like the breath is a big secret. And I call it for me, you know, like, I don't know. Sometimes I feel like I'm, I have this secret, you know, and I'm, <laughs> it's not a secret because I talk about it, but nobody, not everybody wants to listen, you know, but you know, like by being able to slow down your breathing in extreme stress, it's like your mind, like, poof, you know, like clears up to be able to slow down. But also if I do like CrossFit, you have like 15 seconds in between, you know, 
break, I do like, I breathe. <clears throat> Sometimes mouth in, mouth out, but then like the last five seconds, I do exactly as you just said, like mm -hmm. really calm down, you know, make that heartbeat lower. So you use less energy and then you go into the next rep. And it's like the breath is the secret to sports, to calming down, to, to um, not being stressed, to, to whatever, you know, so. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, Man, I can, I, we could go, I could go into this even deeper, like even understanding um, how the way that you breathe is you're, you're tapping into different energy systems as well, mm -hmm. right? So like depending on your sport, um, you know, whether it's aerobic, uh, you know, anaerobic or elactic anaerobic, you are tapping into those energy systems. Can you elaborate uh, on that? Aerobic is active sports. Aerobic. Anaerobic. Anaerobic yeah, so is without oxygen, right? Well, yeah, please say. Please don't. Yeah, exactly. So anaerobic would be, so for example, um, most, you know, short, short bursts of energy, anywhere from what, 10 right. seconds to 30 seconds, you're in the anaerobic energy system, yes. right? 30 seconds to about, uh, you know, I'm, I'm probably, you know, 50 seconds or so, alactic, anaerobic, and then you get to the aer aerobic right, where you're using, you're burning oxygen as your fuel, the most efficient way that we can, that we can operate, because we can regulate that with our breath, mm. right, so when it comes, especially when it comes to, like, long distance, you know, whether they're runners, whether they're, uh, you know, I don't know, kayakers, or, you know, whatever it might be, where they're, where they're, their sport is requiring them to be active over, you know, a minute, and then beyond, we're, a hundred percent looking to train their aerobic system, which the most efficient way for them to keep burning oxygen will be to continuously get back to nasal breathing. Even if they get to a point where, you know, like you said, CO2 is really building up. So they're in their, let's say they're in their, um, they're in their event, uh, which would be different than training and training your event is one way and your training is another mm -hmm. within the event that co2 is really building up right get rid of it right maybe two breaths and then right and then and we nose get back yeah so we get back if you're in. if you're tired you need air nose in mouth out and as soon as you can nose in nose out so, because I used to believe that um, nosing is healthier and it creates nitric oxide and stuff like that. It does, yeah. But if you need a lot of air, you breathe mouth in, mouth out. But then somebody on, yeah, somebody on Facebook, he, t he sent me this, this research where it was actually shown that even though you breathe in through the nose, because of the resistance, because the holes are smaller, because of that resistance, your body takes up more oxygen. So that would mean you actually always want to breathe nose in. And yeah, so it's, nose it's, mouth out. it's less to do with needing to take in oxygen. Your body does crave it, but it's more to do with need, either feeling the need to rid yourself of CO2, mm. right? So it's less about because like if I were to put a pulse oximeter on your finger or your wrist or whatever, you'll see even when you're, you know, CrossFit or you're really, you're running and you, and you feel the need to breathe in and out of your mouth, your, your blood oxygen saturation is still the same. Mm -hmm. So the real, it's not necessarily a need. I don't need to bring in any more. I just need to expel CO2 because I feel like I'm getting stressed. Yeah. But fine, expel a little bit of it. Okay. You're, yeah, because, you're... you know, literally spoken, if you look at our metabolism in the cells, the mitochondria that produce energy in the form of ATP, which is one glucose molecule, water, and no, no, sorry, glucose and oxygen comes together, chemical re reaction, out comes ATP, energy, CO2 and water. So, you know, in that sense, you know, from a, a, on a cellular level, CO2 is a waste, but it has a lot more, you know, like water is a waste there too. 
well, you know, we, we need water as well. So it's kind of the same, you know, like, um, <clears throat> yeah, so nothing is 100% true. CO2 is not, a, it is, yeah, on that cellular level, a waste product, but so is water. But we need enough of it. And building up a tolerance against CO2, which we do by sports, and also with breathing techniques, with breath holds, I would say, you know, some form of apnea or breath hold, I mean. Yeah, and that's kind of the beauty. So like what, you know, the Hoff technique, from my understanding of it, you know, and you can definitely elaborate more, you know, I'd love to hear more is, so when you're over breathing, you're hyperventilating, essentially you're blowing out excess amounts of CO2. And you're creating this, uh, all of a sudden this imbalance, right? Mm -hmm. Where the body, body kind of goes into a state of survival, essentially like, shit there's there's a CO, no c you know there's not the co2 that's readily available and you know um you and you actually start to to tap into um as the default mode network i think starts to get shut down and you're kind of getting into subconscious when that happens but then when you when you go into the breath hold then the co2 starts to build back up mm -hmm. that oxygen saturation starts to starts to occur and, you know, something happens, like, I guess that I'm not fully aware of, like, when you're getting into, like, this, you know, it, you're, you're kind of going between parasympathetic and sympathetic, but even more so, it, you're yeah. playing around with the blood gases, yeah. where it's kind of, you know, it's, it's doing something, something's going on up here that's, uh, that's really fascinating. Yeah. So, um, if you breathe deeper, faster, you breathe out, what I understand, within a minute, you breathe out 50% of the CO2 yeah and um and you know like if you have like an illness say you have COVID, and you are on a saturation of 80 percent you add also 20 percent of oxygen but like normal healthy people are at 96 97 98 to 100 so you only add like one two three or four percent of oxygen but you blow out a lot of co2 this is why you can hold your breath this long Right. You know, and this is this is one of the biohack thingies of breath hold techniques with deeper breathing and breath hold is at the end, you know, like we are triggered to breathe again because of the CO2 that slowly builds up. So here we want to breathe, but the oxygen level is like pretty stable, and then in the end it drops. And what I've noticed that I'm I'm having an oximeter on courses or uh, often people that don't have a lot of experience, that drop is more massive for me it doesn't drop below 70 anymore but somebody who does it for the first time it drops to 50 40 even lower so now when does that occur i'm uh, sorry at, to cut at you the off. end of the breath hold at the end of the hold okay yes. okay what happens there and this is like the biohack thingy our kidneys recognize there's like seriously not enough oxygen in our blood you know like right. if you're in a hospital if the oximeter goes below 90 the saturation the doctors already come running by but they are thinking from a from a continuous point of view well this is temporal you know this is only for a very short moment but in that moment our kidneys recognize the lack of oxygen they make the hormone EPO and EPO is making um, from the red bone marrow, it's making red blood cells. So, a, a Wim Hof practice is actually much like high altitude training because and what you basically do is the same as you do with sports, you know, like run, walk. How you build up stamina by running and by resting, intense, relax, sympathetic fight or flight, the intense breathing. And then in the breath hold, you like drop to the parasympathetic or the rest and digest. And you can really see this in your heartbeat, you know, like say I'm at 60, start breathing deeper. In the beginning, I went up to 120, but my body is used to it now. So it goes up to 90. And then in the breath hold, it goes down to 50, 45. So like within like 20 counts, your heartbeat drops from 90 to like 45. And with that also adrenaline levels go down. Anyway, it's that, you know, it's like, like uh, interval training with running. Through yeah. running, our heartbeat goes up, but if we have a regular running practice, we have a lower heartbeat and therefore um, live healthier and longer than other people, right? Mm -hmm. So um, 
I have another question. That Bohr effect, I've been wondering this for another for a long time. That Bohr effect, when does that hit in? Do you you know, like after one minute of deep breathing, do you think the, the CO2 level in your muscles, say it is okay now, I don't have any physical problems, everything is healthy. And I start breathing deep. When would be the moment where my muscles start um, the CO2 level is too low and oxygen cannot come in anymore. Is it like after one minute or, you know, some people claim you need to breathe for an hour intensely before you get there. And no, I have the feeling nobody really knows, but I know that I don't know. So I thought maybe, you know, <laughs> yeah, I don't, I don't know that I know that, you know, let me make sure, you know, I put this out there. I'm not a scientist. I'm not a doctor. Um, uh, you know, I'm, I'm like you and I've, I, I'm going on my own journey to, to figure this all out. And I guess if I were to just try to even answer that, my, I guess I would say that depending on where, like everybody's different. So if you have a client, you're going to have somebody that is maybe breathes, let's just say they have 20 breaths per minute and their tolerance is to their their, you know, their bolt scores, what we, there's one measurement that we use is below 10 or their extended exhale is below, is like 10 seconds. They really don't have a very good grasp. They're hyperventilators. Yes. Then you have somebody in the middle that might be 12, 13 breaths per minute, right? We're getting somewhere there and their bolt score is like just below 20. Um, they breathe decently well. And then you have somebody up here uh, that is, you know, maybe doing some breath training is an athlete and their bolt scores above 30. They can extend their exhale for over 60 seconds. Um, they have all these measurements. So I would say that all these, these three different people you have, right. <clears throat> they're going to have uh, a different uh, starting point to like when CO2 is, I think CO2 is always, no matter what, um, you know, that it's always in play, but I guess to answer your question, like when is that kind of like, well, we're talking about two things about CO2 resistance. Somebody that is hyperventilating has like zero tolerance for CO2. CO2. Right. And a top sporter has an extreme high tolerance for CO2, but more from a physiological point of view, you know, like, and, um, you know, like, do I, before the bore effect to hit in, say I'm like average, and I start over breathing. You know, I wonder, it's a question that I get and I don't know the answer to, you know, like does that bore effect already kick in if I breathe for three minutes deep? Mm. I don't know. I think it should be like if 50% of my CO2 is released after one minute of, you know, like deep breathing, uh -huh. then that would also probably be the moment that the bore effect kicks in and the oxygen is not going through my muscle and my nerve tissue anymore. Don't you agree? I would certainly say that if your CO2 levels get to 50, you know, they, they're down 50% uh -huh. that the bore effect is certainly not, is not very effective that your body is, is, is essentially going to through saturation is the main way that oxygen is getting delivered to your cells and tissues where affinity is not taking, taking into effect. There's not enough CO2 present. So, I don't, I don't know the exact number to that, mm -hmm. um, but uh, I would certainly say that after 30 heavy breaths like that, um, it'd be hard to see how you, you have enough CO2. Is yeah. that because I know the tingling sensation comes from a lack of CO2, but the cramps, that then too, that is like, that happens after, you know, round three, four. Um, <laughs> what do you call that? What's that called? Uh, we, uh, cramps, you feel it around the mouth and your finger is going, you know, like, and this is the utmost form where somebody's like, I yeah. can't move anymore. Just wait. <laughs> yeah. That is then probably also because of a lack of CO2 slash lack of oxygen, you know, because if you have a lack of CO2, you have a lack of oxygen and not per se the other way around, but for sure, if you have a lack of CO2, do you know why, do you, you can, can you explain that? Is that the CO2? Is that the O2? I, I don't, I don't have the answer to that. <clears throat> no, no, I, don't, I don't know. I, like I said, I do know that the body is going into a, a certain form of like survival state 
And, you know, so what happens when that occurs, you know, there's a lot of different things that are going on. Um, and, you know, whether or not, you know, I know DMT gets released or things of that nature, you know what I mean? But I don't know exactly why that would happen. You know, anytime you're creating like a, a massive shift in your, in your blood gases and your, you know, and your, and your pH levels, you know, there's going to be, you know, outwardly, uh, effect there's cause and effect right and uh, i'm not quite sure why that happens but um, i'd love to find out yeah <laughs> so, you know what you know like people that are watching that this um if you have something to add of you know what we missed please leave a comment and and also if you have a question you know like um like either to Johnny or to me, you know, like, could you get back to this more and more, you know, because I, I love, I really like this conversation and, you know, I'm not a doctor either, but I think that nerds like us are really willing to dive in deep. And sometimes, you know, like we even explain doctors, like you had this in your second year, but let me refresh you, you know, <laughs> so, you know, like, let, let, let us keep on developing and, and, in, um, yeah like like uh, finding out more information so if people want to react to this then um we can do another one of these sessions if uh, if you're up to it oh my and, God, yeah. uh, how can people reach you i will for sure post all your websites in the description of this video but do you you know you live in connecticut is there something you do often or yeah so uh right now it's it's um currently i'm in the process i'm glad you asked so like I'm also, I'm a yoga instructor. I've been a, a yoga instructor for five years. Um, so I've, I'm in the process right now of developing and building my business. That's going to be called Pranayama Studios. Right. Um, so uh, the website is just being built. It's not quite ready yet, but right now people can find me on Instagram. Um, you can just type in John Longinitis. Uh, I think my, my handle is J M E P O S as of right now. Um, you can find me there. I'm always posting stuff. Facebook, you can put in John Longinitis and I, you know, I'm posting stuff. So as of right now, my social media is, is this, is the place that you can find me yeah. putting content Yeah. for now. Yeah. But, uh, by the time this video well, uh, is out, your website is probably finished. I will just, you know, if you want to know more about, about Johnny, then just, you know, watch the description. You see all his websites. Yeah. And, yeah. Um, love that. Yeah, thanks. Well, thank you, man. And where can I, um, so is this going to be posted on your YouTube channel? Yeah. Is this gonna be yeah. Great. And I can send you a weed transfer you to file also if you, if you want. Please do. Yeah. 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 And, uh, I'd love to uh, be able to sit in and do this again. And um, I'll keep uh, checking in with you, the world breathing tribe. I'm so I'm yeah. actually, I'm really honored to. to yeah. Be and you're, you're going to host breathing sessions as well there. I mm -hmm. hope because I would love to join your breathing, man. Yeah. I, I'd love to, man. I'd be honored. I'd be honored. Yeah, um, yeah please. Yeah. <clears throat> I'd be honored. Yeah. I'll, I'll work on developing something that will, uh, that will keep your audience, you know, captivated and, yeah. and then like you guys have been doing for quite some time so yeah cool well thanks a lot for your time and um it's good to meet a fellow brother slash breathing nerd you know like absolutely and i immediately felt it when we talked for the first time like, okay cool <laughs> like this guy you know like, yeah likewise i felt the same yeah. thing <laughs> and uh he's a guy and you speak a little bit of greek Tikanes, I know Tikanes, Kala, Polikala, Feristo, Kesi, Polikala, Feristo, Pupla, Pupla, Kukla, I don't know. Kukla, it's like a doll. A doll, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, uh, yeah, thanks for your time. And um, I'm going to stop the recording like now.